Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you once again for joining us for another uh, educational webinar from Fullscript. Um, today, we are uh, honored to be welcomed by uh, Dr. Rob Kochko. Um, he's going to be speaking to you today about maintaining patient resilience, uh, addressing pain and mental health despite uh, social isolation. Um, Dr. Kochko is the founder and CEO of TribeRx, and he's also uh, the president of the American Association for Naturopathic Physicians. Um, obviously, he's a very busy man, so we're lucky to be joined by him today. So thank you, Dr. Kochko, and take it away. Thank you, Cameron. Really appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, we actually had this webinar scheduled like two months ago and decided like two weeks ago appropriately to make some changes to make it totally relevant um, to the times. Um, so we did adjust things a little bit, but ironically, you know, for better or worse, we've been talking at TribeRx about this idea of the role of social isolation, which everyone's discussing, of social distancing, physical distancing for um, going on three years now, I've been doing research on this and lecturing on it to doctors for longer than that. Um, so really um, unprecedented time. Um, I really want to focus this lecture on this intersection between pain and mental health um, with the understanding that all of that is going to be exacerbated for your patients right now. Um, our goal and our job, I think, as providers um, and working with our patients right now is really focusing on helping them to stay in the here and now. There's a lot of external threat coming in for them. And, and my hope is to give you some actionable tools that you can deliver remotely and virtually um, that can help your patients, again, deal with this intersection of pain and mental health. Because what we're not talking about enough right now is the fact that everyone's worried about this coronavirus, rightfully so, and, and the social um, and public health measures are necessary, but what we're not talking about is the fact that so many people um, had chronic disease prior to this, those diseases aren't going away. And based on what we're gonna be talking about today, um, my premise and our premise is that it's actually going to get worse because social isolation drives um, negative health outcomes in a very real way. Again, this isn't new research. Um, so that's the first goal is to, to give you some actionable tools to bring your patients into the here and now to focus on their plan and to improve um, compliance with your plan through the appropriate behavioral changes that they need. Um, but secondarily is to offer not just support. Um, there's a lot of calls to action these days to make sure that we're reaching out to people who are lonely and isolated and supporting them, but offering the right kind of support. Um, and the right kind of support in this case is ongoing support that really um, focuses on quality over quantity of that support. Um, so I'm thrilled to be here. Um, this is um, a very exciting conversation for me because uh, I feel like finally, you know, we've been screaming this from the rooftops. Um, I, I think finally clinicians are, are really starting to realize how important this is for their patient population. You can tell I'm excited. This is probably the first time I've worn a collared shirt um, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, so, so if that doesn't say that I'm excited, I don't know what does. Um, so we're going to kick this off. Oh, and I should say there are a lot of slides on here. Um, you know, Cameron mentioned the fact that I've been really focused on policy and advocacy for the naturopathic uh, medical profession specifically. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with Tribe, but um, as Andrew Vickery, who's on this call with us, my co-founder for Tribe and um, all, all the providers in my practice can attest to, uh, my focus has really been there on the advocacy and really trying to help um, our healthcare system evolve and adjust to this. Um, so creating this slide deck um, was actually a nice reprieve to get back into clinical work a little bit. And so uh, practically that translated into me getting a little carried away and excited about this topic. And so there are a lot of slides. At times I might speak relatively quickly. Um, fear not, the slide deck was designed um, to be used as a reference later on. We're gonna get into some nutrients towards the second half of this presentation and some botanicals. Um, but the way it was designed was to be a resource that you can look back to at any point. We're going to talk about mechanisms. We're going to talk about appropriate research. We're going to talk about dosing and, and some safety stuff. Um, so you, you don't have to worry about trying to jot everything down. Just sit back, relax. There's already too much information coming at you. And so my hope is that this will um, be something that you can kind of just go along on the ride with. So uh, just a little bit about me. Cameron mentioned the work that we're doing with the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians. My practice is in 
um, Midtown Manhattan at Intersource Health. Um, much like everyone else, we've moved our practice um, totally virtual, especially because we are in New York City. Um, my practice mostly focuses on this combination of, of chronic pain and mental health, but also lifestyle medicine for cardiometabolic risk reduction. And then a lot of my time um, is spent on this healthcare technology startup that we're going to be talking a little bit more about, given how appropriate it is to the times, uh, Tribe RX. Um, so, like Cameron said, times have been busy. Uh, this is actually the second webinar in the series that we've done with Fullscript. Um, the first part of what we're going to be talking about today is going to be a little bit of a review. Um, the, the first webinar um, truly was like three hours of information crammed into one hour uh, of actual lecture um, where we talked about the biopsychosocial pain model and specifically um, tried to step a little bit outside of the biomedical biological paradigm um, and outside of the structural paradigm, which we're going to talk about in a sec, into um, the psychosocial components as a necessary adjunct to the care we're offering. Um, so I, I encourage you, if you didn't get a chance to join us for that webinar, go back, listen to it. It was an hour. Um, we're going to send the slides um, and the recording of this webinar, and we're going to send them both to everyone who's on this call today. Um, but we're going to be doing a little bit of review um, of the original topics just to set the stage for what we're talking about today. I do encourage you to go back and look. Um, in terms of the rest of the agenda, we really want to understand what this intersection actually looks like. What is the epidemiology? Of chronic pain and mental health. Again, your patients who are home right now are still dealing with these chronic conditions. And these two conditions, this idea of chronic pain as a central sensitization and depression, anxiety, and other mental health disorders, um, they're both um, high on the list of things that are that are that I'm concerned about. The research points to uh, might get worse during this time, similar to things like uh, some of our metabolic disorders and people who are sedentary. We are going to review the role of social isolation and social distancing on health outcomes. And then we're going to get into our toolkit. Um, we're going to talk about some nutrition, most specifically isolated nutrients for chronic pain. During the last lecture, we talked about um, some of the research around whole food nutrition um, and ways to address pain as a component of that biopsychosocial model. And then we're going to spend even more time on talking about botanicals. And this is the section, really, the botanical section that um, is meant to be a reference for you. Given how many slides are on here, um, we're not going to try to go through each one and, and discuss them all in detail. I'm going to pause on the ones that I think are uh, most useful and often under underappreciated and undervalued um, within this intersection. Um, but I do encourage you to save the PDF, save this resource for yourself later. And then we're going to talk about um, that second goal that I outlined earlier, this idea of um, ongoing patient support to make sure that our patients are thriving with the unique challenges they're dealing with today. Um, okay, great. So why does this conversation matter, right? We've got 116 million Americans dealing with chronic pain. According to the CDC, more than 20 million Americans deal with what's called high impact chronic pain. That's the kind of pain that impacts their quality of life, their ability to go to work, their ability to play with their grandkids, whatever it is that they value. Um, this is a serious problem. If you're not directly treating pain in your clinic, you better believe that those patients you're treating for diabetes and multiple sclerosis also have chronic pain as a component of that, of course, uh, with the MS specifically. So it's important. Um, we don't want to lose sight with these big numbers of the individual patient story, and that's really the work that you're doing with your patients to offer the kind of support. Um, we touched on this topic last time, a concept that I really like to talk about, this idea of how do we pain-proof ourselves? Patients get this message from their doctors, from their surgeons, from the healthcare system at large that their bodies are broken or damaged in some way and that they need to be healed and fixed based on some external resource. And, and the message of the last lecture was really about, well, actually, let's pause a second and, and teach people that they can feel empowered to help themselves. They can truly pain proof their bodies. And, and the example that I think is most telling um, is the fact that if we look at uh, knee osteoarthritis models, this image on the right looks like a knee that's bone on bone that actually has um, a high propensity for, for dealing with chronic pain. 40% of people who go in for imaging who are bone on bone have no pain at all. 
On the contrary, 15% of people who come in with some level of pain have absolutely normal imaging. There's nothing there. Even on physical exam, they're normal. Sorry, everyone. Um, so those technical difficulties aside, um, you're going to see now that there are 93 slides that we want to try to get to. We're not going to try to get through all of them. Um, this was the agenda I was talking about. Hopefully that was all pretty clear. Um, this idea that we've got a lot of people in this country who are dealing with it. It's absolutely coming into your door. Um, this idea of pain proof, the different images, what is the ecology of people's lives that contributes to their likelihood of experiencing brain pain, centralized pain that um, changes their top down or bottom up inhibitory or facilitatory control. So we covered a lot of these concepts last time. We talked about the idea that we have to step outside of this purely structural, purely biomedical model. That's where the psychosocial components come in. And then we talked about, you know, and see now these slides won't build as, as, as nice as they might, but um, we talked about this idea of the neural matrix. And that's really where our conversation takes off today. We're talking a lot about the role of things like anxiety and depression, but also people's expectation around what it is that's going on in their lives um, as daily phasic input that contributes to their likelihood of experiencing pain and from an action perspective, contributes to the choices that they're making on a behavioral change level, both voluntary and involuntary. Um, to take this and make it relevant for today um, and, and what we're dealing with globally, uh, a lot of these factors that we know contribute to chronic health and chronic disease also contribute to pain mechanisms. So the role of our immune system, the role of our hormonal systems through the HPA axis, the role of our autonomic nervous system in regulating a lot of these things has a very real impact. This isn't a new model. This is something that the original founders of the uh, gate control theory, Melzack and Wall, um, Ronald Melzack actually came out with this in 1990, and it's still not common knowledge and it's still not mainstream, unfortunately. So um, really are trying to shift this understanding and shift this model. And another way I like to think about it is in terms of tiers. There's a model proposed by these, these researchers on the bottom. And by the way, everything that's on these slides is referenced for you. Um, you're gonna be seeing a number on the bottom of most of the slides it's called a PubMed ID. So if you put that into PubMed, you'll get the original resource that I'm talking about here. And so everyone who's gone into a healthcare program and learned about the mechanisms of pain, learned about the spinal thalamic tract and learned about how peripheral activation contributes through the dorsal horn of the spinal cord to actual central experience of pain. But if we take that a step above, this lecture really focuses on um, this second tier. A lot of the mechanisms that we're concerned about for people dealing with social distancing and long-term loneliness are also the types of mechanisms that are activated by physical pain. Beyond the idea that we have an understanding of where our pain is and some basic characteristics of that pain, that's what the spinal thalamic tract tells us. It's the anterior cingulate cortex coming in around how much are we suffering from our pain? What is our need to fix ourselves and do something? There's the insula, that's really our internal thermostat that's focused on, um, am I safe? Is there damage going on that I need to be aware of? There's a the prefrontal cortex, which really focuses a lot of our meaning around pain and, and a lot of our likelihood to, uh, at times, blow out of proportion what we're experiencing. And then there's a parietal cortex, which plays its role as well. Um, I, I see that more taking that Melzack and Wall neural matrix model. Um, I see that more as sort of the tonic day to day. That's again, our social environment, how that contributes to our likelihood of, a, of somaticizing our pain. Then there's phasic control, things like depression, anxiety that, um, that come in and ebb and flow in our lives. And, and that contributes as well through these mechanisms. So we really have to take um, this spinal thalamic tract model that we always learned and really step above it to understand if we're offering the right type of support, which is especially important now. Uh, you know, so much of the work that we do in, in, when we treat pain, and I do this in my practice, is the ability to do physical medicine, is to touch my patients. I do a lot of acupuncture. We can address a lot of these pathways in a very real way. Right now, in our virtual lives, we're relying on counseling. We're relying on teaching people mindfulness tools. We're relying on pain neuroscience education, which we talked about a lot last time. All these components, um, we need to put more weight on them and we need to know how to use them in a very precise way. And again, these are the brain areas that we're targeting. 
And the reason we started TribRx in the first place, and the reason I feel so strongly about this topic is that in a very real way, all the research we have shows us that physical pain and social pain are experienced in much the same way. So much so that our premise is that if a person comes into our office and their pain is an eight out of 10, but they've got no one in their lives who they feel can support them, and they've got no one who they feel truly understands what they're going through, it's activating those same brain regions, those same regions that are uh, related to the suffering they're experiencing, um, as we would expect for someone who, who has a perfect social network that's totally there to support them and has chronic physical pain. And so we really need to understand that this is an important factor for our patients. And that not every person dealing with chronic physical pain, but also social distancing is going to be um, impacted in the same way. There truly is a pain personality. And the pain personality, if we can oversimplify it, really comes down to three core factors. Uh, a person who has low self-efficacy, a person who feels like they can't help themselves get better. We talked about that from the perspective of learning that people can't pain-proof themselves. A person who over-catastrophizes their pain. You know, someone has low back pain and it means that they're never gonna be able to work again. And it causes tremendous changes in their meaning around the situation, that's that prefrontal cortex activation. And then finally, a person who tends to experience severe chronic pain and has a pain personality tends to be hypervigilant to that pain, always on guard, always ready to fight, flee, or freeze. And the person who's hypervigilant, uh, you know, one of the ways I kind of, um, in my history take and get a better sense of that is the person who, I mean, we all know these people, you walk into a room um, and you say hello and they get really startled easily. They're tense, they're on guard, their fear mechanisms, their alarm mechanisms are operating in sympathetic overdrive. And that is the type of personality that increases people's likelihood of developing fibromyalgia and some of those more classic mental health related pain conditions. But we also know about this idea of chronic overlapping pain conditions where um, people with TMJ and low back pain and endometriosis and interstitial cystitis and migraine and, and non-migraine related headaches all tend to have these, so, these sorts of components in them. So our job as clinicians is to help them to feel, oh, is to help them to feel a level of self-trust that they can actually help themselves feel better. It's to help them understand the experience that they're going through. That's that pain neuroscience education component. Um, and it's to help them feel safe in their environment. My concern and my challenge is that this COVID-19 pandemic is making all of these things so much more difficult. You know, um, the, the two salient components of what's so challenging for people right now is they feel that there's a lot of uncertainty and that uncertainty breeds a lot of um, sort of external locus of control and they feel like they don't have control of their own lives. And then there's this invisible threat that everyone's talking about and worrying about. Well, how can you feel safe when there's an invisible threat that's out there to get you? So our job as clinicians um, and what I'm finding in, in the telehealth work that I'm doing with my patients is once you can explain um, sort of the mechanisms of how these things are impacting people, put it into an epidemiologic context and explain and empower them with tools to protect themselves and explain the fact that the people who are being proactive, who have less like, who have lower levels of chronic disease are less likely to be impacted in a severe way, most patients' anxiety is coming down but education is the key that opens that door. Um, and so my concern is if patients aren't checking in with you and they aren't getting this sort of counseling, they're much more likely to be experiencing pain um, in severe ways. Getting into some of the epidemiology around chronic pain and mental health, this is not something new. We know that people who are depressed and anxious have both a higher likelihood of experiencing pain and those who experience pain have a higher likelihood of depression, anxiety, and opioid use disorder, and really substance use disorder across the board. And this has been studied um, a lot, that what you're seeing here on the left is um, a variety of, of mental health conditions and the wide range based on different research studies that, that have been done around their prevalence. Uh, I think a, a slightly easier way to look at it is the likelihood of impact and the, and the um, likelihood, the um, order of magnitude by which people's risk increases with certain conditions. So there was an interesting study on um, 118,000 people with back pain that found that people with back pain were six times more likely to experience depression and vice versa, those with depression were three times more likely to develop back pain. Interestingly though, it's a sort of a linear uh, dose response effect. The rate of depression people experience increased with back pain severity. 
It's a very similar story for anxiety. People with migraine were studied in a large trial. Um, and it looked like people with migraine were two to three times more likely to be diagnosed with all those anxiety conditions, including uh, generalized anxiety disorder, but also people with anxiety disorder were two times more likely to develop migraines. You're seeing the statistics um, on substance use disorder as well. It's about one and a half to three times increased likelihood. So it does become a little bit of a vicious cycle. When we look at all people with long-term chronic pain, it looks like about 61% of people dealing with long-term chronic pain um, have a propensity for depression. But what's super interesting is that um, when we look at the actual outcomes and healthcare utilization statistics, it's the emotional distress that contributes much more to people being out of work and applying for disability and um, going to the emergency room than the actual severity of the pain. So much so that when we study people who are um, pre-surgery, people in the highest uh, categories of depression risk were one third less likely to actually return to work, put another way, return to their normal everyday lives than those people who were in the lower, um, lower quartiles of depression. And interestingly, those who did return to work had a two time higher, um, it took them two times longer to return to work. And so that's really where we get this interplay of depression, hypervigilance, and how it's increasing their pain, it's increasing tension, it's increasing sympathetic tone um, to contribute to all those things. The story is very similar for a lot of those chronic overlapping pain conditions. It's about a 50% prevalence if we look at um, within the last year what people experience um, with things like fibromyalgia and TMJ. And not surprisingly, a lot of the tools that we have in our toolkit for um, dealing with these, these overlapping pain and mental health disorders, things like the SNRIs that impact norepinephrine levels, um, duloxetine is a common one, things like the GABA analogs that really are anticonvulsants, um, but we're using because we don't have a whole lot of tools um, for these chronic overlapping pain and mental health disorders. Um, it's, it's not a surprise. The challenge is a lot of the patients who get prescribed these things go online and they are recommended a tricyclic antidepressant and they don't fully understand why their doctor prescribed something that's supposed to be for their brain for their physical pain. And they're made to feel like they're being told that their pain is all in their head. That's not the case. Frankly, we just don't have a lot of really useful tools for people with this sort of um, brain-related, brain-induced pain. Um, we're gonna get a little bit later into the toolkit that we have, especially from the botanical medicine perspective to impact this um, in a slightly more gentle but still effective way. Importantly, this isn't just a conversation around pain. We know and we've known for a long time that when people are lonely and isolated, their risk goes up across the board for chronic disease. You're seeing on the screen 29% higher likelihood of heart disease, 32% higher likelihood of stroke. We see that people's recurrence of cancer, there was a um, April, I think 27, there was a 20 year longitudinal study that was published on women with breast cancer and their likelihood of recurrence, you know, it, it makes some sense around morbidity and mortality, but their likelihood of actual recurrence of their breast cancer over that 20 year increased by 43%. And so this touches everyone, every chronic disease. It even touches our elder population Seniors who are isolated for about 10 years have a 49% higher likelihood of developing dementia. Um, and so if we put this into uh, perspective with other determinants of health, it's as dangerous to be lonely as it is to smoke 15 cigarettes per day. It's two times more dangerous to be lonely than it is to be obese. Um, rates of suicide go up about 10 times in actual successful suicide attempts. All said, our likelihood of early mortality for people who don't have the types of social relationships that are necessary in their lives goes up about 50%. If we compare, compare that again to things like um, alcoholism and air pollution, those are 20, 30, 40% um, orders of magnitude less than the role of social isolation. Again, you have to be thinking about this for every one of your consults that's reaching out to you today. This is not a problem that is new and it's been growing over time. It's just exacerbated now. AARP did a study of seniors that looked um, really, this wasn't today, this was uh, 2018, um, that said about 43% of seniors didn't feel they had the necessary support in their lives. So how is that contributing to outcomes? We touched on the brain regions, and I made a note here, this is not an anatomically correct image, so, so please don't judge me for putting these lines where they are. Um, but these are the main areas that um, sit at this intersection of mental health and physical, and physical pain. 
Um, and what's important is when we're counseling our patients to offer very targeted signals of safety, to help them understand that you've got them and that they don't need to figure out how to help themselves, that their suffering is in your hands, that will impact the anterior sing of the cortex. Helping people feel safe and whole, bringing them to the here and now, however you do that, biofeedback, focusing on their breath, whatever it is, um, doing a, a body, body scan, progressive muscle relaxation, bringing them to the here and now, and noticing the parts of themselves that feel good, but well, that activates the anterior insula. The prefrontal cortex, that's where your education and counseling comes in, helping them to understand the difference between acute and chronic pain, helping them to understand um, the role and, and the factors that contribute to anxiety and depression that will directly impact the prefrontal cortex and help them form new meanings around their experience. We talked a lot about acceptance and commitment therapy last time. That really works beautifully here. And then the somatosensory cortex, um, that's where a lot of our um, biomedical tools are gonna be really helpful. And, and we're gonna talk about, again, some nutrients and botanicals in time. Now, what's important here, when, when people hear loneliness, they think of a one-to-one -one correlation between loneliness and unhappiness. And that's not really the case. Um, what we're finding in, in all the research, um, John Cacioppo, who's now passed um, out of the University of Chicago, did a whole bunch of this research. Um, and what, what him and his team found was that it was really the sense of perceived safety that was most impacted, as opposed to likelihood of, of having unhappiness as a one-to-one -one correlation of their pain. So again, helping our patients feel safe is essential, but truly our, our ability to perceive the world around us changes. People who feel lonely, um, have a much higher propensity to get positive reward. So put another way, to get a dopamine hit from objects than from people. And they're much more likely to um, have difficult seeing a friendly face as one that's actually, you know, a smile from a, from a friend as one that's actually there to help them. Pe people who feel chronically lonely and isolated um, tend to be on guard which creates a little bit of a vicious cycle. And importantly, we don't have to have 5,000 Facebook friends. It's about the quality of the relationships, not the quantity. And the way to really think about that is how many people um, do the patients in your, lot, in, your, in your practice, the patients and clients you work with, how many people can they reach out to in their time of greatest need? Certainly coronavirus is one of those. Um, so, so we're seeing in a very real way, a way to assess the, the social networks and the community that people have um, to support them. When we work, when we look at pain, we're gonna try to go through these next um, 10 or 15 slides relatively quickly, but when we look at pain, we have to look at it from a whole person, whole body perspective. Yes, we're talking a lot about central sensation, but there's a genetic mechanism. There's a systemic and metabolic mechanism, things like immune activation and H HPA access and inflammatory pathways. And then the peripheral nervous system is actually very deeply impacted as well. And so that's where all your tools come in things like physical medicine adjustments, acupuncture, uh, massage, whatever it is that you're doing for your patients on a physical level. When it comes to central sensitization and the role that the central nervous system has, as I mentioned earlier, there's a top-down and a bottom-up control. And it's that inhibitory control that the brain is sending the body, most often through the what's called the PAG, the periaqueductal gray. It's a, it's a part of the spinal cord that goes around the central canal through its combination to something called the uh, rostral ventral medial medulla. These two parts of the brain get signals from our amygdala, get signals from our frontal cortex and that ACC that we talked about and decide whether they're gonna turn off the pain mechanisms coming in from our periphery or not. And so some of the nutrients and botanicals we're gonna talk about directly impact those pathways. And looking at the difference between acute and chronic pain, it seems like NMDA receptors, um, activated by glutamate, which is our main excitatory neurotransmitter that everyone likes to talk about, um, seem to be most responsible for acute pain, but pain chronification happens on a broader scale. Pain chronification happens when um, specific neurons, and in particular microglia, are activated in the brain, and they impact the local environment around them through things like inflammation and things like changes in neurotransmitter control and neurotransmitter production. So um, it's important to understand that the mechanisms are different. Interestingly, um, there's a lot of interesting research going on around ketamine right now for chronic depression and chronic pain. Ketamine seems to work on NMDA receptors. That's probably why it's most useful. Um, all of this is made worse, and in particular, the activation of the microglia if we have a hyperactive immune system. People who tend 
um, to be more pro-inflammatory. People who tend to mount that TH1 response, which parenthetically we're really interested in right now in terms of the botanicals we have and, and their ability to deal with uh, this novel coronavirus. But if we have a TH1 forward cascade, as opposed to a TH2 cascade, we have a higher likelihood of that um, neurological inflammation that can contribute to pain sensitization. We've got a couple tools in our toolkit. I listed just a few here, but I really love rosemarinic acid. I love certain plant sterols. Romania is a really useful tool to impact this TH1, TH2 balance. Similarly, that microglia, um, in terms of tools in our toolkit, um, low-dose naltrexone, if it impacts chronic pain, at around four and a half milligrams per dose um, seems to have its effect, at least the research, my interpretation of the research through um, this toll-like receptor four activation of microglia dampens down that likelihood of pain chronification, probably not that useful at that dose for acute pain, but for your patients with chronic pain where nothing else is working and it's in your scope, it might be worth considering and talking to them about. In terms of this idea of top-down inhibitory control, we have a couple of um, excitatory chemicals and neurotransmitters. Many people have heard of substance P. Substance P is really having its impact on the periphery, especially um, people who have elevations in substance P um, tend to experience pain at, at sub-threshold levels. So they're second order neurons in the dorsal horn and that sensory component of the spinal cord um, are activated um, much more easily when, when um, there's an imbalance in substance P production. Same thing with glutamate. We talked about that from, um, from a, an acute pain and NMDA receptor perspective. I think more interesting for our needs is what is it that our brains might not be producing enough of to have that top-down appropriate inhibitory control through that periaqueductal gray. And GABA and glycine seem to be the most important neuron that dampen down that neuronal excitability that gets us to have that sub-threshold response um, to otherwise normal pain stimuli. We've heard about hyperalgesia and um, opioid-induced hyperalgesia. Well, it seems like those mechanisms are GABA and glycine related. Um, I'm going to skip a couple of these slides. Like I said, we um, there were like 130 slides originally. I pared 40 of them down, um, and then I decided it would be too much to talk about some of this. But there are uh, systemic mechanisms around CNS inhibition, and peripheral sensitization. Um, and then everything we know that contributes to inflammation also contributes to both mental health and chronic pain. And so people are particularly interested in the role of the cytokine storm right now and how NF-kappa beta and TNF-alpha impact that. Interleukin-6 is probably our most important pro-inflammatory interleukin, um, but it's really the whole uh, milieu, the whole terrain of inflammatory cascades that's most important here. And so all this means is that if your patient is chronically inflamed, their likelihood of having that centralized pain and that depression is drastically increased. That's why some of our tools like turmeric, which everyone loves for inflammation, actually seems to work for depression and anxiety, which was a surprise to researchers um, before, before we really figured this out. Um, we knew it worked for pain, but it actually is quite helpful for depression, probably because of these systemic inflammatory mechanisms. As an important correlate, people with mitochondrial dysfunction tend to present with things like chronic pain and chronic fatigue, right? And so, especially with conditions like fibromyalgia, we have to be looking at the role of the mitochondria, its ability through the electron transport chain um, to produce ATP, its ability to quell um, oxidative states, and its ability to modulate calcium homeostasis, which is how a lot of these second order neurons are actually activated. We're not going to get into a lot of the therapeutics we have for mitochondrial support, but these are your classic antioxidants, nutrient cofactors for that electron transport chain. We will talk about L-carnitine a little bit and general redox support that you're probably already doing for your patients. It's just important to think about, again, at this intersection of pain and, um, and mental health. We've known as naturopathic doctors that when in doubt, you treat the gut, that so much happens between this connection between the digestive system and the brain, and that happens on multiple levels. It happens on a neural level. We know, for example, through the activity of the vagus nerve, that if we do a truncal vagotomy, if we actually sever the vagus nerve to, to treat um, peptic ulcer, we actually have reduction in neurological disorders like Parkinson's. Interestingly, though, People who've had these disorders 
don't seem to get the same benefit from a probiotic like lactobacillus um, after they've had the vagotomy. So there's an important connection between the, the gut and the brain, most likely through that parasympathetic side of things, most likely through that vagus nerve. Similarly, we know that a lot of the bacteria in our gut can produce every important neurotransmitter from hydroxytryptamine to um, acetylcholine and dopamine and GABA and norepinephrine. Every important neurotransmitter that contributes to these things is impacted by our microbiome. We know that digestive inflammation contributes to whole body inflammation. So if we're not getting that under control, um, we're much more likely to experience these neuropsychiatric symptoms. And we see that in people with chronic digestive infections, things like SIBO, but also with inflammatory bowel conditions like Crohn's and colitis, their likelihood of experiencing uh, neuropsych disorders, but also whole body pain increases drastically. Um, same thing with the, the um, bacteria ability to produce short chain fatty acids. They have a very direct metabolic effect on our central perception of pain mechanisms. Um, and then it's important to say that the digestive system isn't just the digestive system. There are a lot of endocrine-like molecules that are produced, um, things like neuropeptide Y and ghrelin that we know from a, um, from a food consumption perspective, but also things like oxytocin, which is really important for social bonding. And so the health of the digestive tract truly, if your patients and clients are not getting the, the support they need and you don't know where to start, fix their gut, and a lot of the case will sort of start to resolve itself. Um, so that's an old time sort of naturopathic trick. And we know that um, the microbiome and in recent research on the microbiome, which truly we're learning, you know, in the last six years, I think we've got 85% of the research that's been done on the role of the microbiome and health outcomes. So we're going to learn a whole lot in the next decade. But even with what we know now, we know that um, impaired phyla in the microbiome especially that bacterioides and Firmicutes phylum, if that balance is not where it needs to be, we have an increased risk of visceral pain. That makes sense with things like inflammatory bowel disease, but also whole body inflammatory pain, neuropathic pain, headaches, and it actually impacts people's opioid tolerance. Interestingly, on the therapeutic side of things, probiotics and prebiotics do have some really early research on therapeutic benefit. People who eat a low FODMAP diet, if that changes their gut flora, seem to do better with whole body pain um, and similarly, we're seeing some interesting things with fecal microbiome transplants, originally, of course, used for things like Clostridium difficile infection, um, some early and really exciting research in the last couple of years, especially around inflammatory bowel disease, um, improving from fecal microbiota. Um, the slides that I will send will have all these uh, really useful images from, from really top-end studies, but I'm just going to skip them in the interest of time. Um, and then before we get into some of our therapeutics, I just want to review that first webinar that we talked about. Again, talked about addressing a lot of these things from the role of mindfulness, acceptance and commitment therapy, and, and, and CBT as a subcomponent of that, offering our patients pain management education and helping them to feel like they can self-manage their pain and helping them to understand the importance of expressing their experience around their pain. Similarly, we talked about the role of physical activity for chronic pain disorders, sleep, and the role of whole diet, whole food nutrition from a pain perspective. We're gonna get into some of the nutrients that might be specifically correlated, again, in this interplay between chronic pain and mental health. One component that doesn't fit neatly into that box that I really think is worth talking about is the role of light exposure. So if you haven't heard yet, there's really interesting research on seasonal affective disorder. The, the research seems to show that at least 5,000 lux or 5,000 lumen for 30 minutes a day. Um, I think the stronger research has, has a, a standardized dose of 10,000 lumens. So that's what I recommend for my patients. But when we look at people with seasonal affective disorder, depression rates go down considerably comparing to things like fluoxetine, but also as an adjunct to that therapy. So it can be a standalone monotherapy or as a support for people who already are on things like antidepressants. That's from the mental health perspective. I think that there's a lot that we're going to learn about the role of our environment around pain. And I think our diurnal rhythm and our cortisol production and our ability to engage with the world around us also naturally has to be, has to impact our chronic pain. So I'm curious, um, and we know sort of in sub- uh, subcategory studies around the use of laser and things like that for pain. I'm really curious to see if things like light boxes are going to prove to be effective for chronic pain. Certainly for the chronic pain patient, that's 61% of people with long-term pain 
who experiences some level of depression, it's worth considering and adding into your toolbox. So I'm just doing a time check. We're probably gonna go maybe 10 minutes over. Um, Cameron, feel free to chime in if the, if the webinar will kick us off just because we got off to a little bit of a slow start. It'll go as long as you go, so we're gonna go on that. All right, good. Um, I just, I know I'm talking fast and I don't wanna speak any more quickly <laughs> than I need to, but I wanna share all this information. So two categories here, nutrients as therapeutic targets for this intersection and then botanicals as therapeutic targets for this intersection. And it makes sense that there are a lot of shared mechanisms around poor nutrition and likelihood for, for developing a lot of these chronic conditions, inflammatory cascades, increased oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction. Of course, our food affects our gut and our microbiome. And so we need to be thinking about this from truly a 30,000 foot view to understand how whole food nutrition impacts things. But I really wanna highlight some very specific targeted nutrients starting um, with specific foods that are components of that whole food diet. So if we look at um, large, a large meta-analysis of 21 studies across the globe, it looks like there is increased depression risk, and it's not gonna be surprising, in people who eat lots of red and processed meat, refined grains, sweets, high-fat dairy, potatoes and gravy, and who are not eating fruits and vegetables. I'm not telling you anything new, but I hope that this buffers um, buffers your confidence in telling your patients who are depressed, hey, this really matters. It's as important as the medication you're on. It's as important as your exercise and everything else. Similarly, um, people who eat a whole grain diet with enough fish and olive oil, more of a Mediterranean type diet, have a reduced likelihood of experiencing depression. When we look at specific trace metals, um, I, the strongest study that I can find in my literature review was around rheumatoid arthritis, but I think it's a telling model for everything else that we're experiencing. Um, is that people with lower levels of selenium and zinc tend to have higher levels of chronic pain and people with increased levels of copper, which is interesting given what we understand about the competitive inhibition, the, com the competition for absorption between copper and zinc. So if you're supplementing someone with zinc, they should be taking about a milligram of copper for every 15 milligrams of zinc. Um, so that makes sense. Selenium and zinc from an immune perspective probably also useful for corona-like viruses. So um, that's an important aside there. Uh, lithium has been in the research for a long time, especially around anxiety. We don't have a huge amount of randomized controlled trials in humans, but what we do know is that the safety profile for lithium orotate at the types of doses that we'd be recommending for things like anxiety, I start with a five milligram dose, I might double that over time, um, is quite, uh, safe comparable to higher dose lithium or lithium carbonate, where we of course have to be much more careful. In terms of the impact on things like chronic pain and mental illness, we mostly have to extrapolate from areas where there are deficiencies. So places where people get enough lithium in the soil and in their food supply seems to correlate to um, lower likelihood of mental health. Now that is not a causative um, link there, but it's enough to say it's probably safe. In my clinical practice, I see it's quite effective and quite helpful. There are some smaller trials that I didn't highlight here, but very honestly, the, the, the lithium orotate trials are quite limited at this dose. We know about the role of omegas. I'm not going to tell you anything new about omegas except to say that um, insufficient omega-3s correlate to chronic pain, and mental health disorders probably to their impact of, of some of the interleukins, that interleukin one that I mentioned, the tumor necrosis factor alpha, and their likelihood of reducing matrix metalloproteinases, which seem to have a role to play, especially in arthritic models, really uh, breaking down cartilage and increasing the um, likelihood of growth of that cartilage breakdown. Um, all of these slides where there's a, a really solid research-based dose available. I'll highlight that dose. So again, it'll be a resource for you. It looks like for an anti-inflammatory dose, I go much higher. I typically will go around three grams. Um, in rheumatoid arthritis models, the minimum is about 2.6 grams of EPA VHA um, to have that therapeutic effect. Um, I'm gonna sort of lump in here resveratrol and pycnogenol. Resveratrol, most of our sources, everyone likes to think about wine uh, for resveratrol, but um, Japanese knotweed in terms of some more supplements and nutrients, things that you might find on Fullscript, 
is going to be um, our most common source. Again, it does all those same things. It inhibits tumor necrosis factor alpha. It reduces NF-kappa beta activation. It's directly anti-inflammatory. And there's some interesting research um, at fairly low doses um, that it actually impacts rheumatoid arthritis models. You want to be careful because it does have some theoretical blood thinning effects through antiplatelet activity. Um, so that's a pretty wide range in the research. Um, some patients, you do go up pretty high to about 500 milligrams, but most people don't think about resveratrol from a pain perspective. And given some of those um, peripheral inflammatory mechanisms, I think it's worth um, considering. Uh, similarly, pycnogenol. Pycnogenol has been in use for like 2,000 years. Um, you see on the screen French maritime pine bark extract. Um, the most important um, molecular target seems to be the oligomeric proanthocyanidins in terms of their antioxidant effect. And it does the same thing. It reduces inflammation directly. It inhibits these MMPs, matrix metalloproteinases, and in inhibits NF-kappa beta, which directly reduces the likelihood of that peripheral to central pain. We do have some interesting research around pain and disability. Again, pycnogenol is not something we think of often, I think it's worth adding to your toolkit, especially in patients uh, for whom your normal tools um, are not as effective as you'd like them to be. We talked about the role of mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, most people at this point know that L-carnitine and its role in transferring fatty acids across the mitochondrial membrane to increase beta, beta oxidation of fats. Um, again, something that we often don't consider, but if you've got a patient coming in with chronic pain, chronic fatigue, who also has some depression, Carnitine is a really interesting tool, and importantly, it does have some interesting research around things like fibromyalgia and even osteoarthritis, which is a little, was a little bit more of a surprise to me. I've never considered it from that perspective, um, but I'm going to start using that more, and maybe on a future webinar, um, I will report back. Vitamin D, most people know that is helpful, um, but what's really interesting in the research and, and what I find in my clinical practice is the pain reduction that people experience from vitamin D doesn't actually linearly correlate to serum levels. You know, everyone has had that patient or client who has been taking mega doses of vitamin D and their levels never go up. Well, probably you need to be looking at stealth infection or chronic inflammation in those patients because they're most likely overconverting to the 125, the calcitriol variety of um, vitamin D as opposed to that 25 hydroxy storage form. But People can still experience pain reduction through supplementation, and that seems to have both genomic and non-genomic effects on the way the nervous system and the muscle fibers are, are, are it's experiencing that nociceptive um, impact. 5-HTP, we haven't really talked about the role of serotonin here. We talked about the importance of glycine and GABA as inhibitory neurotransmitters. Serotonin plays a huge and important role, of course, in things like mental health. From a pain standpoint, even low doses, 50 to 100 milligrams um, multiple times a day seems to be helpful from a fibromyalgia perspective. And of course, that makes sense mechanistically in terms of its ability to impact sleep, its ability to impact mood. So I wouldn't... Um, I wouldn't caution you in using 5-HTP. Of course, be careful in people who are on things like SSRIs. Um, interestingly, just clinical experience-wise, I find, and we've talked about this in our practice and other practitioners seem to feel the same way, that um, L-tryptophan on its own, of course, in higher dose than what we'd be giving the 5-HTP, seems to actually work a little bit better for sleep, um, especially sleep initiation. So um, that the full mechanism isn't clear to me, but um, something to consider for sleep. Um, from a pain perspective, I think 5-HTP works uh, much better. We talked about the role of GABA and glycine as inhibitory neurotransmitters. And so I hope this isn't too small on the screen, um, but this is a presynaptic nociceptive neuron. A release of glutamate attaches to other receptors inclusive of NMDA. We've got these microglia that we talked about earlier that exacerbate this whole process. And then we've got the inhibitory neuron that if working effectively reduces glycine and GABA. But what's interesting is it seems that CBD, which is the hot new thing, um, especially for things like anxiety and pain and sleep, seems to potentiate the release of that glycine and GABA um, in its impact on those same GABAergic and glycinergic receptors. So might be one of the mechanisms for why CBD um, plays its role. 
On the first webinar, I won't repeat these. We covered bromelain, ASUs, capsaicin, and its impact on substance P, which we talked about earlier, as well as glucosamine and chondroitin. Um, there's a bunch of others we can consider. Of course, you have to personalize this for your patients that you're working with, things like magnesium and CoQ10. And for specific pain conditions, especially things like neuropathies, of course, the B vitamins can play an important role. As far as botanicals, I'm going to sort of just highlight the ones that are useful so that you can go back and remember to look at them um, at these slides later so that you have them in your toolkit and have them as a reference. We're only going to be talking about the ones that have these little check boxes on them. Saffron uh, in the last uh, probably two years has been one of my favorite anti botanical antidepressants. Um, there, saffron has a lot of um, Therapeutic constituents, constituents seems like picrochrysin is um, the most important of them, but they're, through the ethanol extracts that we need to extract them, there, are, of course, is a lot of synergy between these constituents. So I don't think we should be isolating um, some of these nutrients, but um, picrochrysin has antidepressant effects, anti-inflammatory effects, anxiolytic effects. It kind of checks all of our boxes. And importantly, it stands up to the research. If we do a, a, a meta-analysis around depression, about, um, about a similar effect to placebo, but importantly, um, with a much higher safety profile. So if we compare saffron, typical starting dose is about 15 milligrams to Cymbalta, which is one of those SNRIs that was on that chart in the beginning. What we find is that um, it can be quite effective for depression as a monotherapy. I think it actually works better combined with other therapies and it's safer, which is really important for our patients. It can be pretty expensive. It's one of the more, um, expensive nutrients we have out there, but the, the long tradition of use has really been used um, in some of the Persian traditions of medicine. Um, and really the, a lot of the research in the last, I'd say, 15 years has been coming out of there. Um, it, it's really worth considering if you're not using for your patients. Um, we talked earlier about the role of turmeric. This is just a research review for you to look back at later, how turmeric impacts mental health and chronic pain. Um, similarly, St. John's Ward, I won't spend a lot of time talking about St. John's work as most people know about it. Um, a caution in using it with adolescents. Um, we just don't have a whole bunch of research just from my perspective. Um, I will say though that, um, you know, most people at this point and especially in, in Europe feel comfortable recommending it for mild to moderate depression. I actually think it'd be qu it can be quite useful for severe depression, but it needs to be done with appropriate counseling and appropriate medications alongside that. But the mechanisms are all there. It impacts serotonin, dopamine, GABA, really everything we want. Um, in a botanical based on some of those earlier mechanisms. We talked about um, caution. Uh, St. John's word hypericum activates CYP3A4. So any uh, pharmaceuticals that your patients are taking, um, you really want to be cautious of there. Um, interesting research in anxiety, a little bit more needed in pain, but especially um, nerve-related pain, I find um, it can be it can be quite helpful. Rhodiola rosea, I actually love combining with saffron. Um, slightly different mechanism. Rhodiola seems to work on a monoamine oxidase A inhibitory pathway. And of course, through the HPA axis, it impacts cortisol. Super helpful for depression. We have pretty solid research. The dose I have on the screen is 340 milligrams. I typically start with 200 milligrams in the morning and then go from there um, and use it. It's quite safe, it's quite helpful, really helpful also for those patients who are feeling physically exhausted um, and, and mentally exhausted all the same. Um, lavender, um, most of the research around lavender has been around Selexan, that extract, but there's pretty good confirmation of efficacy in larger reviews. The latest was in 2019, that seems to confirm that it's useful for anxiety. Um, I've used it with a couple of patients uh, for pain, but not as their direct, um, sort of primary treatment. I, I think it's quite helpful um, there as well, but probably through impacting their anxiety and their likelihood, again, to be hypervigilant, so not a direct treatment of pain. I love go-to cola. Um, Centella seems to have um, some gabinergic effects, which of course increases um, or reduces anxiety. It can serve as an antidepressant. From a pain perspective, I mostly think about Centella um, from a a nerve pain kind of perspective. And we do have some research around diabetic neuropathy and go-to cola being helpful. Otherwise, you are, of course, thinking about it for blood flow to the brain, for memory issues and things like that. I find it's quite useful, but in a very calming, anxiolytic type way. 
Skullcap, Skullcap is getting a whole bunch of press these days, um, possibly for its quercetin concentration, um, spe specifically Scutellaria bicolensis is being used, but the Latera flora has been studied, um, seems to work much like a benzodiazepine, seems to affect GABA receptors, um, and importantly for our mechanisms here, it has a pretty strong anti-inflammatory effect. So if I'm putting together a formula for someone and I'm looking for um, calming, but also anti-inflammatory pathways, skull cap is often pretty high on that list. I'll be curious to see from the TCM perspective, because it isn't a lot of formulas, how its cousin, Scutellaria bicolensis, seems to fare. It's sort of on my, on my list of things to consider for patients coming in with COVID-like concerns. Another calming antiviral is Melissa officinalis. Um, it seems to have its impact again through GABA, but in a slightly different mechanism. It doesn't directly impact the GABA receptor. Um, it inhibits GABA transaminase, so much like an SSRI, it just keeps in keeps that GABA molecule in circulation for longer. Um, in patients with chronic angina, which is a whole different pain mechanism altogether, of course, we do see some interesting research around depression and anxiety. Um, and pain. I also think about this for patients with herpetic type pain, people who are hyperthyroid in particular, and people with hypertension. So it's it's worth adding to your toolkit. It's not just a calming herb. It's got a pretty useful, um, pretty useful palette. Passion flower is probably my favorite botanical for for helping our patients feel a little bit calmer to sort of take the edge off. I really think about this from the perspective of that patient who comes in. And they say, well, I can't sleep, but it's because my mind is always racing. We've known for a long time that passion flower seems to have um, a similar benzodiazepine type impact. Um, it works comparably to midazolam in the right doses. I like to combine it with, with actual glycine powder. Um, sorry if you guys are hearing the truck outside. I find that uh, the benzo component and the glycine component seem to work well together. It doesn't have the type of addictive properties that something like Xanax will, but for most of my patients, I do have them take a day or two off, maybe every 10 or 12 days. So every once in a while to take a day off so that it doesn't have um, any uh, dependence level of concern. Kava is, I think, one of our strongest mucous membrane anodynes to reduce mucous membrane-like pain. It's also a useful antispasmodic and centrally acting muscle relaxant which of course will impact pain, but will impact anxiety. I think about this for patients with things like throat pain, um, digestive issues, sort of mucosal pain, pain from UTIs. Of course, with kava, um, in these doses, it's been shown to be quite safe, but there are a lot of concerns around people drinking alcohol who are already on benzodiazepines. It's the cavalactones that we want to be particularly concerned with. Um, but those cavalactones have GABA-related activity, much like a lot of the other botanicals that we're talking about. And again, we mostly think about it from an anxiety perspective, but kava seems to have some direct analgesic effects as well, mostly from traditional use, um, but we're, we're finding some of the research is showing that as well. White willow bark, um, people know about Salix alba. It's interesting that the salicin content seems to not be the, the main driver. And the salicin without um, sufficient other flavonoids in the plant doesn't seem to be as effective and it's anti-inflammatory and pain relieving effects. Um, so those flavonoids are really important. Giving the whole plant is really important, but it's worth considering um, in your patients. Of course, you wanna be cautious. Um, you don't wanna give this to children for the same theoretical concerns around aspirin, around Ray's syndrome and things like that. Um, you wanna be cautious in people who are allergic to salicylates in general, so something else to consider. Um, and you wanna be cautious for people with things like peptic ulcers. Um, so that's worth exploring as well. Arnica Montana, I mostly use um, as a, a topical. I find it can be quite helpful. Another topical we're gonna get to is I find Devil's Claw can be quite helpful in, in a cream form or in a gel. Um, Arnica, I'll let you read the research. There's actually a pretty strong Cochrane review that showed in an OA model that it was helpful and effective. Um, Boswellia we covered in the last um, in the last lecture, but it actually works similarly to what our turmeric does. And there is some pretty strong Cochrane level evidence um, to show that it's effective for pain um, at specific doses. It seems like the, the formula matters most. You need very specific boswellic acids for it to be effective um, in treating pain, especially things like arthritis. Um, I really like horsetail. These are some of the botanicals just in the interest of time. It's all written out here for you in terms of 
the constituents that are useful, the mechanisms that are at play, and the dose that you should consider in your practice. Same thing with Devil's Claw. I mostly use it topically, but it is a pretty useful um, osteoarthritis-related um, anti-inflammatory based on those same mechanisms around NF-kappa beta, tumor necrosis, and some of those interleukins. Um, so again, we're seeing um, some of the same mechanisms at play for all these. Sesame oil, pretty well researched, specifically in knee osteoarthritis. That's where, for some reason, I saw most of the research, um, but functionally, it seems to be quite helpful. I haven't used sesame oil in my practice, um, but I thought this was worth putting up in terms of literature review. Um, Symphytum comfrey, uh, we know about it, for, about it for its tissue healing components. We know about the allantoin and its cellular repair mechanisms. Another one I use topically, um, you want to use with caution, especially with things like open wounds, um, because you don't want it to close up that wound and, and create some kind of propensity for an infection. Ginger, probably one of our, one of our most useful anti-inflammatories. Um, importantly, it has not just COX-2, but um, COX-1, 2, and LOX um, impacting pathways. Seems to actually combine very well with glucosamine. I typically start with a gram per day uh, for ginger. The last two botanicals that I just want to touch on are not as well researched, but I find clinically, if used appropriately and safely, can be quite effective. Jamaican dogwood, really strong spasmolytic, um, has some really centrally acting anodyne analgesic properties. I usually use it in tincture form, 10 to 20 drops, three times a day is, is where I'll start. And in sensitive patients, I'll, I'll start much, uh, much lower. And California poppy, um, especially those patients who are coming in um, who want to get off opioids and things like that, I find can be quite helpful. It is um, one of our strongest sedatives, um, so used cautiously, but um, anxiety, pain, especially visceral type pain, I find it can be quite helpful. So all those tools that we talked about are useful and can be delivered through a virtual telehealth practice. You don't need to be in front of your patient and you can help them today with these tools. But a lot of what people are focusing on right now is transitioning their practice to telehealth. And my premise is that telehealth is necessary right now, especially from a practice management standpoint. We need to keep our doors open so that there are doors to be kept open after this is all over. But I think from, a, from the perspective that we talked about in the beginning around the social support side of things, especially in patients who are socially distanced and who are of that pain personality to be at higher risk to experience pain as a result of social distancing, I think telehealth is necessary but not sufficient. We need very frequent touch points for those patients. But also importantly, we need to understand that those frequent touch points aren't just good for our patients, they're good for ourselves. We have to think about ourselves and our ability to be of service here and understand that we have to be taking care of ourselves. So telehealth can be great. It can also be taking a toll on us if all we're doing is giving, giving, giving. So I encourage you um, to also develop your own social networks so that you can have the resilience to offer your patients what they need. Personally, I find um, that my telehealth consults require more energy from me. I, I don't know what that is. I know a lot of people love them. Um, I find that without some of the nonverbal cues and some of the nonverbal experience, um, it's much more of an effort. So I feel much more drained uh, after telehealth visits. But I think with time, we'll sort of learn to adjust with this. But what I want to talk about now is the role of peers to address much of these concerns and much of these much of these challenges. So if we take um, the important assumption that people who are socially isolated are at higher risk of mental health issues and chronic pain, I hope I've, I've helped you establish that in your mind and for your practices. What I want to transition to is what supports are there beyond the one-on-one -on -one telehealth consult that's available to us? And what supports are there beyond the clinician to patient relationship? Importantly, in the way at TribeRx we talk about peers, and importantly, the way the research um, confirms the value of peers, there's nothing that can replace specific lived experience of a chronic condition. Now, when it comes to social distancing, we've all got this shared lived experience. And I think for a lot of the patients that I've been working with, it actually is helping them deal with it more effectively. The fact that we're all sort of all in this together. But these people probably had some form of chronic disease when they came in to see you. That's why they're working with you. And specific lived experience around that actual chronic disease 
needs to be an adjunct to the work that you're doing. Now, if you have a very focused practice based on your chronic condition that you've learned to heal for yourself and now you're working with other patients and clients, great, you probably don't need this. For all the rest of us, if we're dealing with patients who are experiencing diabetes or who deal with heart disease or an autoimmune condition, there's nothing that can replace very specific lived experience in doing two things. The first is directly changing those pain mechanisms and those mental health mechanisms. But the second, importantly, is in driving necessary behavioral change and sticking to the treatment plans that we find to be useful if people do so. There's nothing like peer support to drive that point home. I highlighted a lot of evidence here. We've got a couple of really strong studies that show that peers, peers with a capital P with appropriate training, who have lived experience, who are activated in the right way, can help our patients uh, feel much better. That's what we do at TribRx. We connect your patients with peers who are trained on this model that we've been talking about here, but also on uh, who, who've dealt with chronic pain and mental health disorders, who have recovered as a result of all the techniques that we've now covered in these two webinars. And importantly, they are available to offer understanding, to offer support, but also to help your patients um, to enact the treatment plans that you're already prescribing for them. So here's the key. If we send people home, especially in this day and age where they're going home and their routines are all over the place, if we send people home with a perfect evidence-based treatment plan and we know it'll work so long as they do it, if they just exercise and change their diet and take some of these nutrients and botanicals that I prescribed, it'll really work. We've all experienced those patients that were so excited when we write up a treatment plan but it doesn't quite translate to them actually getting better. And the reason it doesn't translate to them getting better is they cannot enact that in their everyday lives. That's where peers, peers with a capital P, and, and I will say um, different from health coaches, and health coaches have tremendous value here, but there's nothing like specific lived experience around pain. That's where peers come in to take your treatment plans, help them be more, be more effective, but also to augment the telehealth that you're offering. They augment that using our program through ongoing chat, and then also one-on-one -on -one video support to offer that support when and where people need it in their lives to then send patients back to you based on your unique needs. So this is a technology augmented solution. We're not gonna solve social isolation and loneliness through technology alone, but this is a necessary technology augment to make sure that people, again, get the support they need where and when they need it. A secondary component is the fact that we help these patients track their progress and track the plan that you put them on. And working with their peer, um, patients develop a customized wellness plan, a customized treatment plan. Again, taking your recommendations, turning it into a wellness plan and then tracking it over time. Alongside though, um, like we talked about earlier, everyone has different meaning around their experience of their chronic disease. So our peers help your patients and help any patients to formulate um, personalized trackers based on their unique needs. So for someone that might mean being able to play with their grandkids, for another person that might mean being able to get out of pain well enough so that they can go back to their job when this is all said and done, peers help patients make sense of those things and turn that into real action. They drive behavioral change and like I said, they increase compliance with specifically prescribed protocols and then send them back to you for continued care. Peers aren't replacing your care, they're sending back um, they're, send, they're being sent back to you for continuing care, but importantly, they're sending back, uh, they're coming back with a data-driven understanding of how our patients are doing, tracking things like sleep and movement, pairing with uh, whatever technology they're already using, their Fitbit, their Garmin, et cetera, tracking water intake, vegetable intake, supplement intake, mindfulness practices, whatever it might be. Our peers help you make sense of how your patients and clients are doing that 99% of the time stepping outside of, um, of your telehealth or in-person practice. Um, and therein lies the real values that it keeps them informed. And then we try to make sense of that in a data-driven way along multiple parameters. Of course, we care about their pain, we care about their opioid risk, but we also care about their emotional health and how much support they're feeling. And they're feeling like they can self-manage their pain. All of this is quantified to help you get a better understanding of how your individual patient is doing so we can have patients coming in with chronic back pain or cancer-related pain or pain that's a result of, of psycho-emotional psycho trauma. Peers help you make sense of that in between the work you're doing with them and then informing you 
when your patients are heading in the wrong direction, that is the value of someone with lived experience. So in terms of um, the work that um, we're doing to help provider practices get through this very difficult time, uh, really there are four steps there. If you have patients in mind who are dealing with mental health issues or dealing with chronic pain, um, or frankly, who just need extra support in their lives, you go on our website, you quite literally prescribe the psychosocial support like you prescribe everything else. There's a referral button on the website. We'll link out, out to this um, through the Fullscript platform. Once those peers are, are prescribed our program, they meet for free, no charge at all, with one of our peers with specific lived experience to their needs based on what you filled out in that referral form, and they develop a customized wellness plan. That customized wellness plan takes your treatment recommendations and turns it into an actual plan for the patient. If that's all the, pa the person needs, that's fine. We're happy to be of service and help people navigate things from the perspective of shared lived experience. But when patients need more support, that's where our peers come in, are available to them to have one-on-one -on -one sessions, video or phone calls, to work through our mobile app, um, through a chat-based platform, both on a one-on-one -on -one basis and a group uh, setting, and then to track progress. And like I said earlier, step four is informing you, having a direct line of communication with this peer to get a better understanding of how your patients are doing, offering you full reports on how your patients are doing, and then again, sending them right back um, for a follow-up treatment plan. So we covered a lot. Um, I hope that the tools in this toolkit, and again, hold, hold on to this as a resource for you, will be useful. These are things that you can offer today, tomorrow to your patients, especially in terms of some of those botanical tools, if you weren't considering them. But I hope you'll also consider the value of peers in this um, brave new world of social distancing and the need for offering our patients really comprehensive and ongoing support. There's nothing like connecting people with someone who really understands what they're going through. Cameron, I'll take maybe uh, two or three questions if you saw anything come through, um, and I can also scroll here. Thank you everyone who's, who's stayed on. Um, I know we're about 15 minutes over time, but um, so I do have one question here, um, wondering if Trivarex is available in Canada. Uh, it is. Um, we can offer this and we can offer peers um, through our telehealth platform. Um, really across the globe, we're focusing on the U.S. and Canada, um, but absolutely available. Um, I'm seeing some questions here around, um, is, is Tribe a paid app? It is a paid program for patients moving forward um, after that customized wellness plan. Uh, but we really want to customize the program based on your practice needs. And importantly, if you've got a lot of patients you want to send through, which we're fully capable of taking on, we can customize a program where people keep coming back to you and we actually customize the payment model based on that. Um, another question here, are peers trained to support LGBTQ community? Um, absolutely. Um, our training program is culturally informed. Um, we make sure that peers understand how to work with people of all types, but importantly, when possible, once we get a customized wellness plan set up and once we get a better sense of what that person needs, we want to connect them to someone who's um, who has a, a shared lived experience as much as possible. So sometimes we can offer really precise peer-to-peer peer -peer connections and sometimes it's a little bit more broad, but whenever possible, we do try to take advantage of that. That's a great question. Um, thank you, Lori. Um, another question around the recording. Yes, the recording will come in. Um, what I'll do is I'll follow up with everyone and send both the slides and the recording and just some more information on the website. Um, questions around the use of lithium orotate with SSRIs. Um, it hasn't been fully studied, but mechanistically, I think it would be safe to use with some of our other mood stabilizers. Thank you for that question. Um, do I use labs to decide what therapies to use with my patients? Yes, um, you know, especially from that systemic metabolic standpoint, we have to consider personalizing treatment as much as possible. But I would venture to say 90% of what we talked about here, you don't actually need labs to do. I do genomic analysis for my patients and I look at inflammatory cascades and I do digestive studies and things like that but you can accomplish so much just through conversation and counseling. And when we get back into the real world, physically touching our patients is, is essential. 
question here as to how we are sharing data with referral caregivers. So the peer is in touch directly with the referring provider or caregiver, um, and we do that in a HIPAA compliant way. We offer uh, personalized reports, but um, importantly, we don't want to say that we can quantify a person's lived experience. So importantly, the, this is a very person-centered approach and we're making sure um, to give people um, and providers a really thorough and, and at times subjective understanding of how their patients are doing. It, it seems to be much more impactful and important, but we do have the mechanism to deliver that um, securely in a HIPAA compliant way. Um, the comment on using Nervagesic by Mediherb. Um, I love Mediherb, it's a great company. Um, thank you for that. Have peers been shown to improve outcomes? Uh, that's a great question. So um, what we see is for the people dealing with the most difficult to treat conditions, substance use disorder, chronic mental health conditions, absolutely we have the data to, to confirm um, that we can improve outcomes so much so that uh, where I practice in New York, Medicaid will actually cover peers to work with our patients with very specific diagnoses around mental health and substance use. Part of our mission, um, and I'll paraphrase uh, my friend and co-founder Andrew Vickery here, part of my mission um, is to make sure that peers are ubiquitous everywhere. That when, and again, I'm, I'm stealing this from Andrew, but when we consider 10 years from now taking peers, people who lived experience out, out of the healthcare system, it'll be as foolish as taking nurses out today. You'll actually have your jaw drop. How can we take people out of the healthcare system who have lived experience. Um, and all of that is true because of those outcomes we have. In that study on peer, slide on peer support, slide 81, that you're seeing here, I did link um, to uh, just a, a subset of those studies. Here are the PubMed IDs. So please, please go in and check it out. Um, we also have an evidence page on our website. If you go to tribarx.com forward slash evidence, um, it does highlight some of the positive research around peers. But that's a great question. Is the peers program part of Fullscript? Great, great question. So we're, we're not directly um, part of Fullscript. We are a Fullscript partner. And what we are doing is offering uh, providers who come in through the Fullscript ecosystem a discount. Um, go on our website, tribarx forward slash schedule, set up a call with someone on our team. We'd be happy to tell you um, all about that program and um, make sure to note that you came in through the Fullscript ecosystem so we can honor that as well. But um, Absolutely, we're thrilled to partner with Fullscript, especially in this day and age where everything has to be virtual. Um, we, we feel that it's a, it's a perfect complement. Um, okay, great. All right, um, I see a couple of other questions coming in. Um, one last question around which which products do, do I mostly use in my clinical practice? That's actually a great question. I, I promised Cameron setting up a protocol on the Fullscript uh, protocols page. We'll do that. I'll, I'll link to some of my favorites on there. So, so keep an eye on the Fullscript page for that. Um, and with that, thank you, everyone. We went 20 minutes over, but I, I'll, I'll forgive myself given our slow start. Um, thank you for continuing to be attentive. The amount of attendees that stayed <laughs> is really heartwarming for me, given that everyone probably has online learning fatigue at this time. Be safe, be well, take care of each other, reach out, know that you guys and, and we all need support just as much of our patient, as much as our patients. It's that same idea that, you know, put on your oxygen mask before you put, put it on for someone else. Um, we have to protect ourselves. So make sure that you're getting the support you need um, in your practice. Make sure you're not feeling alone and caring for this. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.